So I'd like to remind um, you guys, and especially those um, at home, uh, that uh, on Wednesday, November 5th, that's a week from today, there'll be, a, there'll be an exam. There'll be closed notes, closed books, no notes, no calculator. And it'll be through the material from last Wednesday, which will be transmission lines up until right up and right up. And I think the last thing we did was derive the Smith chart, right? And so that sort of is the line of demarcation um, in the uh, uh, for the for the lectures. Okay. All right. Um, so we're off on the on the, one of our our last main topics, and then we'll have some Lani app at the end. Um, what, we'll, what we'll talk about tonight and next time and several lectures, several weeks to come, will be the antenna problem. Okay, so we'll look, we'll look at antennas um, finally. And just to put this in context of what we, where we have been and, and, and um, uh, where we are now, is, um, let's see, we haven't done this in a while. What's your favorite Maxwell's equation? I'll give you the minus sign in there. And what goes in front of here? Good. I didn't hear that, um, but that's just my, I'm just getting old and deaf and senile and all kinds of other things. But yeah, that's a good one. And then what's, an, uh, what, um, what's your favorite one? Good. Good. Yours? Um, well, there isn't that many. There's two left, right? Yep. Uh, but you're, all of them should be your favorites. Or should they? <laughs> Good point. <laughs> okay, so we have um, the divergence of B. Good. Good. Last one? And I think it's important that you, since there's no closed notes, uh, no books, it's, uh, for the test next week, it's, uh, you might as well go ahead and memorize these, these four equations. They are the starting point of, um, of electromagnetics, and they're certainly the starting point of where we are now. Now, if you remember what we've done with plane waves and, other, and our solutions to the wave equations, eventually what we did was we, we got rid of these two terms, right? We were, we were always in a source-free region. There was no charge or moving charge. And so, so what, we were, what we were sort of thinking to ourselves is, is we, were, we had an antenna, a light bulb or, or what have you, but we had something that, where current was dancing around and generating, and generating a, an electromagnetic wave. And then we moved away from that electromagnetic wave. That, that source, rather. We moved away from that source. And so we were, if this whole wall were radiating current, as long as we were away from that wall, we were in a current-free and a charge-free region. And so we asked ourselves a question, if supposing we were there, what did the field look like and, and what did it do? And we found that one of, the, one of our solutions was a plane wave that moved away from it. Okay? But in the antenna problem, the sources, this one and to a lesser degree that one, are, the, are really the stars of the show. Okay? So in an antenna problem, what we have is we will, we, will, we will celebrate the fact that we have current and we will ask in response to that current, what does the H, E, B, and D field looks like, look like? Okay? So that's our... That's our. That's our. Um, that's really our, 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 um, our goal. The, so everything, everything that we have will have to do with this J. Okay. Now let me just go ahead and tell you what the roadmap that we're going to follow is. I don't. I think I've mentioned this before. But what we're going to do is we're going to get. We're going to say, we're going to do an analysis problem. Not necessarily a design problem, but an analysis problem. And we're just going to say, given a J, 
given a j, what is the vector potential that gives rise to that j? Remember de Lambert's equations? So we have the wave equation for A, and that was forced by J. So we're going to say, what is, given J, what is the A? Okay, we have to figure out how we're going to do that. And then, and then from the A, remember A, you got B, which is, for all intents and purposes in this course, H. And given that, That gave us the electric fields, D and E. And then E, e and H gives us S. So the roadmap that we're going to follow, and sometimes it might take us a couple of different classes to follow this roadmap, because there, there is a little bit of math here, um, will be J to A to H to E to S. So we'll ask, what is the intermediate vector, intermediary, the vector potential? Then we'll say, given that, what, how, do we, how do we get H? And that's a curl. Then we'll take a curl, and we'll get another curl, and we'll get E. And once we have H and E, we'll cross-product them together to get the flow of energy, to get the power flow. Okay? And that's generally, in an in a, in a, in a antenna problem, that's generally what you want. You want, you want to set up an antenna to, to, to pump power from one point in space to another point in space. And so, and so this, from, from S, that, that gives us link budgets, it gives us shapes, all the, all the other issues. Okay? So this is, this is our antenna roadmap. Now, one of the things that's going to be hard about this problem, one of the things that's going to be hard about this problem is that it's going to be, is, is the coordinate system. Okay? So let me have some strange shape of J and rho. Okay, so some weird antenna looking thing. On, do on top of that is going to be a J and a rho. Okay. And I'm going to have some observation point out here, P. And we're not going to be satisfied at sitting at just one observation point, are we? We're going to want, it, we're going to want P to be general. And, well, gee, you know, I don't know what part of this weird blob antenna I'm, I'm interested in. In fact, if you think about it, the J here and the J here and the J here and the J here are all going to contribute somehow to the, to the A, to the H, to the E, to the S that we see at P. At that, at, that, at that position P, at the measurement position. So I can't favor any one, element, any one particular place on this, on, this, um, on this antenna, so I'd better just consider a small arbitrary point or a little volume of current and charge that sits there, anywhere along that, and I've got to locate it so I'm going to have to have an origin. And the point is I can't put my origin here because I'm also interested in current down here and up here. And I can't put my origin here because I'm also interested in what the, what the field is going to be at other locations. So I'm stuck. I've got to have an arbitrary origin. The, the, the vector that connects the origin to the observation point P, I'm going to call that R, X A sub X plus Y A sub Y plus Z A sub Z. Okay. Now, in fact, most of what we're going to be doing is spherical coordinates. Okay. If you think about it, the antenna, an antenna problem is fundamentally spherical in nature. So this is our, this is the, I remember I promised that we would break from Cartesian coordinates. And I think I made the prediction that most of you are, are, are going to be bored of Cartesian coordinates. Isn't that the case? Not really? <laughs> well, 
it's at least a little bit exciting to move on and, and get to spherical coordinates. So in my notation, in my problem, R is going to be from the origin to P. And this volume on the antenna will be dV prime because the vector that connects from my origin to dV prime will be the R prime coordinate. Okay. And then lastly, the vector that connects those guys there, I'm going to label capital R. And R will equal R prime plus capital R. So I can go from my origin to P directly through R, or I can go to dV and then out to P. Okay? Now just pause for a second and imagine our derivations a few days to come few weeks to come, and I'm going to have our primes in there, I'm going to have capital R's, I'm going to have little r's in there. So it's probably a good idea to kind of, we'll, we'll need to get comfortable with which, which r is which. Okay? And I, and, I, and, I'll, and I promise that I'll try not to stray from this geometry. Okay? In fact, I, I, will, hold, I will hold that promise, I will keep that promise. Unless I forget the little slash, which you know me to be able to do that on time to time. Okay? So, what we are interested in is, is um, oh, a note on the spherical coordinates, right? No matter what shape this funny looking banana thing is, this mutated blob of current is, if I get very far away from it, can I tell the shape of it? Not really. You know, if I go a certain distance away, I'll start seeing it as a line. And then as I go further away, that line's going to get shorter and shorter and shorter. And so that means that however I look at this, as long as I'm very, very far away, it's going to look the same to me. And that's the, that's the argument for spherical symmetry. Now, up close, that may not be exactly the case. Right up close, there may there may be there may be more radiation or energy in one air in one angle or one direction along capital R than another. And remember, you just have to think about a dish antenna for that. Right, if you have a dish antenna on your roof to to see a satellite signal on Direct TV or whatever that is, you've got a curved surface. And you better align that surface, that curve up, really, really carefully with the satellite so that it will collect and focus down onto the diode that's sitting on that arm that sticks out over there. Okay? So, so, so that is a case where if you're behind the antenna, it still looks like a speck, but you're not going to get any energy there. Okay? Um, so, if you look at our roadmap, if you look at our roadmap, what we care about is V and A at P. That's what we want. That's what that's what that's what our our, our problem is. All right. Now I'm going to do, I'm going to do this two different ways. Okay. The first way. is the heuristic approach for a potential. Okay? And I'm going to start with the only formula that we know to get from one spot in space to another to get the potential. And that's the voltage due to a point charge 
It looks like that. I think TJ went over that with you guys, right? If I have a point charge Q and I go some distance away from it R, by the way, in any direction, spherical coordinate system, then the voltage due to that, the potential due to that, is Q over R in times some factor. It takes into account the shape and takes into account the, the material. Okay? So 4 pi, 4 pi R cubed, 4 thirds pi R squared, those kinds of things, right? That, that speaks to a sphere. Okay? All right. That's for an individual charge. And that's just an example. So if I have a group of charges, and again, I think this is right out of TJ's playbook, or if I have a group of individual charges, then the voltage is just the linear superposition of each and every one of those charges weighted, weighted by how far you are away from them. What word can't you read? Pardon? Which one? Oh, the group of individual charges. Individual charge. Sorry. Oh, and this is potential, not personal. Okay. So you see how we went from there to there. Now, now in my problem, in my blob, I don't have individual charges. I've got a charge distribution rho. And it doesn't take a lot of imagination to replace the summation with an integral. And what goes in the interval, integral to, to make up for the Q will be the charge distribution. Okay. And here's where we have to kind of look at things a little bit. The charge distribution is going to be located at my R prime coordinate. Right? And I'm going to integrate over the volume that is that ugly looking blob of, 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 an, of, a, of, a, of an antenna. Okay? So the R prime coordinate system locates us to the, to the source and then connecting a point on that with the observation point P where I care about what my potential is, will be the capital R. Okay. And if, if, if rho is, is static, if rho is just a static, then, then this is all we need. And you know, um, A doesn't even, A, A, D, A, D, T goes to zero. I can take the divergence of this and I can get E. So first, if this is a static case, then I, go, I can go from J, I can go from rho directly to a V, directly to an E. And I'm home free. I'm done. Okay? So that, that was, that's the connection, rho to a potential V to a potential E, just by taking the gradient of what that V is and I'm done for a static case. Okay. If I have steady currents, right, then I'll get an A, a not very interesting A, but I'll get an A. And I'll have to write the same kind of an integral to add up all the summations of all those steady currents. So 
the DV prime will tell me where the steady currents are. The R will tell me where to connect from the steady currents to the observation point. Okay. So I can describe where my currents are as J of R prime. So the rho becomes a J, R to R, DV prime, D, DV, DV prime. I have to worry a little bit about what goes on in front here. The geometry factor is the same, but the uh, material now has to go through mu. Okay, so So for, at least for steady currents, at least for steady currents, I, I, I can move from my, my current density to my A. And I don't know, maybe some of you have, um, well, I think some of you have actually done some line integrals like this for, uh, say, a, a, wire, a, a metal detector or things of that nature. You probably skipped the A step for simple statics, magnetostatics. You can go directly from J to B pretty easily. It's just the addition of a mu. It's not too terribly hard. But this is but within our formalism, this is this is great. Now we care about, I'm going to add in the R here. Okay? So V is a function of R. Oh, I didn't comment on that. V is a function of R and A is a function of R. That's this R here, right? I'm interested to know what V as a function of R is and what A as a function of R at my observation point, and I locate my observation point with that vector R. Okay? So again, R, R prime, and R, R, R prime, and capital R. So this maps directly to the coordinate system that we set up, okay? Now, well, we don't have steady currents in our problem. Oh, let me, let me also point out one other thing. I made I messed up here. Um, a is a vector, and then because J has a current has a has a direction, J is also a vector. So this is just a scalar expression that this is actually a vector expression. Okay. So now if I just say, okay, well, gee, um, everything's going to change as a function of time. I have that, and I'll just do this. Oops. Like that. Am I done? Why not? Is there something wrong with this? Look carefully at it. Think carefully about this. Let me let me let me go back to look at those for just a sec. Let's go back to the picture. Okay. What I've done is I've let J and rho at these, at these points here change as a function of time. So I have J as a function of time and rho as a function of time. So far, so good, right? And if these guys are changing as a function of time, 
then you would expect my something to change at my observation point, right? But what have I what have I done that's wrong about these two equations? It's subtle. Let me, let, me, let me push a little bit on this, okay? Supposing there's no current whatsoever there, okay? And, and then all of a sudden, I snap my fingers and there is current scurrying around this, this antenna, okay? That means that this J, at some instant of when I snap the switch, starts moving on this antenna. That's that T there, right? But it's also this T here. Time delay, right? If the sun, if the sun turns off instantaneously, we're not going to know it for how many minutes? How many? Sounds good to me. We won't know it for eight minutes because of a change when a solar flare goes off, it doesn't affect our satellite communication for the delay that it takes for that electromagnetic radiation to go and, 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 and shake, up the, shake up the ionosphere. Okay? So this... That can't be the same T. There is a delay between the antenna and the A that's located at way off the antenna. A foot a nanosecond. So the signal that gets here A and the, the signal that's the, the response at A and V must be a delayed response to the change in the current or the or the charge. And the formal word that we use is retarded. Okay? The 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 potentials are retarded behind the current change. Okay? And we know from our work with plane waves, from our work with solving the wave equations, we know exactly what that delay should, have, should be. So I'm still interested in what happens at A at a time t. So all of, all this is this is fine, but I now have to I have to shift this t back in time to account for that eight minute del propagation delay. So that's going to be t minus capital R over v. Okay, so I'm looking backwards in time. T minus a certain amount, and the amount is capital R which is this distance here, divided by the speed that it takes to go there. So a foot a nanosecond at the speed of light moving that many feet. Okay? And so this, this, is, this term here becomes my retarded potential.
Now, let me ask you, great electrical engineers, see that T minus R over V? That's like a T minus a tau. What, 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 what integral, what famous integrals have you played with that have a T minus tau in them or a T minus R over V? Almost. Same course. Convolutions. Okay. So, uh, so automatically we're seeing sort of the hint there of a convolution. Now let me go back to our differential equations we started the day with. J is my input into my system. Right? This is a linear time invariant system. So the response of the system is going to somehow have to be written as the convolution of this with the, res the impulse response of the system. Right? And the impulse response of the system can be based on an infinitesimal, an infinitesimal point. Okay? We'll derive that formally. But that's sort of where we are. Now, now think about it from, think about it from um, a differential equations perspective. Right? We solve the unforced case, and that gives us the homogeneous solution. Right? Is that the word you used in way, way back in differential equations? And then the, the when I force, when, with a forcing term, we have the particular solution and that particular solution is, is written as the integral of the homogeneous solution with the for forcing term. So way, way, way back in, in your di early differential equations course you were, saw, you were looking at convolutions but you were using all the different terminologies and that's why, that's why it's, you don't always make that connection. But this, that's exactly what we have to do here. So we have to set, solve differential equations that are forced. So we solve them with the respect to the unforced case, and that's the delta function response. And then, and then the, the particular solution is going to take into account the particular nature of the driving term, which is the J, and the delta function response of that whole system. Okay? And so we're already seeing that from this heuristic hand-waving approach, which got us really pretty far along. I mean, we had a small crisis here, right? We, we built from, you know, a single charge to a group of charges to continuous smear of charges to a continuous smear of currents. We played around with time. We made a mistake. We figured that mistake out. And so we're doing pretty well here. There's nothing real wrong about that. Okay? That's sort of the intuitive, hand-waving, you know, heuristic approach. So our second, more formal way is to solve that differential equation. And remember our roadmap, we're going to go from J to A. So the differential equation is not exactly this group here. The differential equation is going to be de Lambert's equation. That was the fir very first wave equation we met, right? Do you remember our long discussion of gauges? That would make a good test question. We had that long discussion of, of, of gauges on, and, and, and everything, but we came down with this really nice second derivative in space of A, second derivative in time. That was the first time we met the speed of light in this course. 1 over C squared was equal to mu epsilon. And, and now we have this, um, this forcing term on the right-hand side of this. And just for grins,
I'll write down the other Lambert's equation for the voltage. So the first thing we'll do is we'll Fourier transform those equations or we'll, do, we'll apply separation of variables or we'll assume that everything is, has sinusoidal variation. So I've separated A as a function of R and T into A, of R, a prime of R and then E to the I omega T. So there'll be an e to, e to the i omega t here. When I take the derivative, there's still going to be an e to the i omega t. The i omega will come down twice. And because j is also harmonic, there'll be an e to the i omega t here. So these substitutions will solve these equations in the time domain, in the time dependence. By the way, there was one other expression. It's a little, it's redundant, but it's useful. Connecting A and V. This was, in fact, the gauge. And if I Fourier transform that, So remember that we also have E minus the gradient of V. Now with time variation, I have this del A del T. Here's V. So this becomes
Um, yeah, these are all primes. And then I also know that H is equal to the curl of A, 1 over, my, 1 over mu times the curl of A. So J from this equation will lead to A. A will lead to E. And then we also get H, which means we also get S. And that's where we get our roadmap from. Okay. All right. Now, I want to look. Based on this guy here. Based on this guy here, our heuristic approach, based on our knowledge of convolutions and impulse function responses, I want to look for a form That my yes. What's the what's the unit or a? Oh, um, this is uh, amps per meter. This is Henry's per meter. So if I multiply through, and I have and I multiply another meter through, I'll get I'll get I'll get my my units for a. Which is amps or uh, amps per meter. Um, meters, uh, uh, Henry, amps, Henry, Henry. The me uh, divided by meters, oh, multiplied by meters, amps, Henry, meter, okay? We could also get it in terms of volts from this equation, volts per meter, we have this version there, and uh, that's a wavelength. So that's a meters there. So meters, meters. Because in the first equation, you have a field equal to the, the voltage. Because this voltage is kq over r, right? Mm -hmm. And then when you get the derivative, I guess you get kq over r squared, which is an electric field. Mm -hmm. So here's another way to do it. Here's, my, here's Henry's per meter. Here's amps per meter cubed. There's a meter cubed here. Nothing. <laughs> a is a, okay. Did you were, did you um, were you able to see the lecture where I derived uh, these two equations? Yeah. Okay. So it was a long. It was a very long um, lecture where I, I I tried to lay the groundwork for that. Um, it's on it's on e-learning, and I'd, I'd I'd really encourage you to go back through it. But let me give you the highlights to answer your question now. Um, the. Um, the E and the H exert forces on a particle. Okay, so that's sort of at the force level. Um, v we're comfortable with V because we have voltmeters and we, we we've built up a familiarity with voltage volts. But that's a but more abstractly, it's at a potential level. So I integrate something to get up to V and I differentiate something to get back down to 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 um, to E. I'm sorry, yeah, to E. Well, I can do the same thing 
um, with the magnetics of the situation, and I can come up with a potential. It happens to be vector. And so, and so if I can construct that, I can take a derivative of that and get back down to H here at the field level. Take the derivative here, and I get back down to E. A is a potential, but because, because there's a degree of freedom in there, A is not physically measurable. So A is very much an abstract mathematical property. It's a construction that makes our life incredibly easy for these kinds of problems. But it, as we've pointed out because of the discussion on gauge, it's not unique. And therefore, it's not, it's, you can't build an A meter. Okay? Which is why my flippant answer of nothing <laughs> was, was motivated. Okay? So, so I, I, I spent a lot of time kind of dancing around that, um, in, that in that lecture or two. Um, and it was for exactly this kind of a reason. It's, it is an intermediary. It is an intermediary that allows us to get something useful at the end. Okay, but, but can we measure that precisely? No, no, it, that's, that's, that's the problem. We can measure it to within a, curve, a curved surface. Okay, so it's not even a constant. It's a much more complicated expression than that. And the units wise, well, you know, you can, you can come up with the units any way you want from looking at these equations you know, and just inferring what the units are. Okay? All right. Oh, so I thought you were going to complain about this. I would have complained about that. We commonly use for an impulse function response H, right, in signals and systems. But the last I checked, one of our favorite fields is already H. So I can't really use... Notation-wise, I can't really use the H. E, F, G, H. Well, G, G is close to that, so I'm going to use a G there. Okay? That's a, so that, so that, that's a small, unfortunate point of confusion. So the delta function response, and then this is, this is very, really unfortunate, the delta function response, the reason we use G is in, the, in this field it's called a Green's function. And I think it's unfortunate because you guys have spent so much time learning convolutions and impulse function responses and all that terminology, and from the physics perspective, when, when, you, when the physicists learn all this, they learn it with respect to a Green's function. And so it's, it's, it's what, I'm, what I'd like to do is just reinforce to you that the Green's function is nothing more than an impulse function response with maybe the slight change that the impulse function response is in space, not in time. But that shouldn't make a big deal of difference. Okay. So to get the delta function response, I go to this equation here. And the left-hand side, well, the right-hand side is got to be a very, very specific type of J. It's got to be a delta function. Right? Here's my, here's my system. This is my input. Shove a delta function there, and I'll get the, on the left hand side, I'll get the response of that delta function. Okay? So watch what I'm going to write.
So if I go back to that equation, I've got a del squared of the response. So I'm going to have the del squared of now I'll call it G for Green's function response or for the impulse function response. The right-hand side, J, will just be a delta function. And that's actually and that's a delta function in space, a point source antenna, if you want to think about it that way. And then this dispersion constant here, omega mu epsilon, I'm just going to lump that as a del squared operator. And that del squared operator can have losses in there and anything else I want in there. Okay? That's, my, that's a, sort of a propagation constant special for this, for this, uh, for this delta function. Okay, any question about that? All right, now, the, this has to hold for all parts of space. And it is a delta function, right? So it's a little spike of disturbance in R, in X, Y, and Z. And so, if I think about that, and certainly if I go far away from that, that disturbance is going to be very is going to be highly symmetric in in space, and the symmetry is going to be spherical symmetry. So I can't tell the difference of a delta function disturbance. Picture a three picture a a, a, a tank of water, and in, inside that tank of water, I have an instantaneous disturbance a little point disturb disturbance, no matter where I am in the, in the tank, the disturbance is going to look the same. Okay? So that little ripple in three-dimensional space is going to propagate out. So there's going to be no dependence in the phi angle or no dependence in the theta angle in the spherical coordinate system. It's only going to depend on R. So from that argument we learn that this is spherical and only with respect to the distance r. Okay? So if I look up in a coordinate system, if I find my way of taking my Laplacian, I have that. This whole mess is just from the from the using spherical coordinates. If I do this out, I'll get this to be 1 over r, d2 dr squared of rg. And if I multiply through by r, I've got the product of rg here and I've got the product of rg here. So I can solve this equation for RG.
And finally, I can divide back by R. And so I can derive what my, my Green's function is. And e to the plus or minus gamma r. And that gamma has a real part and an imaginary part. So think damped exponentials. Damped sinusoids, rather. Exponentially damped sinusoids. And I have that 1 over r in there. And that capital C represents the strength of my delta function. And we have to play around a little bit to figure out what that C is. But bottom line, that's, that's the form of our, of our Green's function. And you can start to see There's that 1 over r in there. There's a 1 over r in there as well. And this is a delta function response. And it's a delta function response to a de Lambert's equation, which looks a lot like that. OK? So. So now let me substitute this guy here back into this guy here, OK? And just see what we're looking at. My constant, del squared my second term. And that's equal to minus del of r. Now, what do we know about a delta function? If, I, if I'm away from the delta function even a little bit, what's the magnitude of the delta function? I have a delta function that's located at x equals 0, y equals 0, and z equals 0. If I move to x equals 1, y1, one, z1, one, what what's this? 0. If I move just a little bit off of that, it's equal to 0. If I'm on it, what's it equal to? Inf it's singular. It's infinity. And the way we tame that infinity is we, um, is we integrate around that. So what we'll do is we'll go to r equal to 0. And OK, I get into trouble with this 1 over r here and this 1 over r here. So this 1 over r gives me an infinity. This guy gives me an infinity. And this guy will also give me an infinity. So maybe that's OK. But if I get close to the if I get close to 0, I, one thing I do know is that e to the minus gamma 0 will equal 1. Okay? So as I, as, I, as, I shrink down, as I shrink down, then then e to the minus gamma r equal to e to the minus gamma 0 is equal to 1. And so in order to tame this, Delta function singularity, we integrate, right? It's, it's a singular, it goes to infinity, but its area, or in this case its volume, is going to be a constant. It's going to be finite. So to tame the delta that singularity, we're going to integrate.
Okay, so now let's take a look at each one of these terms. This term here, if I consider the volume integral dV, this is on the order of r cubed, right? The volume is x, y, z, so that's r cubed. And if I consider then the volume of 1 over r dV, that's got to be the order of r squared, right? So as r goes to 0, this term goes to 0. So I've got some constant term times the integral of the volume of del squared of 1 over r dv, and that's going to equal the left-hand side like that. Now let's go ahead back to something we do know. We do know that the, the, the volume for a point charge, and a point charge is a pretty good delta function, is going to equal this. And then I also know that this will hold, get rid of the, get rid of the time derivative, and so I'll have del squared of that, of that particular voltage will be matched with a delta function on this side. So I do know something about this. So on the right-hand side, I wrote my point charge as a delta function. The strength of that point charge is Q. And then I have a 1 over epsilon there. And I also know that the field, the voltage, due to a point charge is Q over 4 pi epsilon r. So del squared of this guy here has to equal Q over epsilon times del of r. So I pull all these constants out of the out of this term, out of the derivative. And I have 4 pi epsilon over Q times Q over epsilon times del of R. The strength of that point charge cancels. The material we're in cancels. So I'm left with del squared of 1 over r is equal to 4 pi del of r. Okay. And so now if I take back a look at this guy here, I've got the constant times the del squared of 1 over r, and that's equal to minus del of r. So that del squared of 1 over r turns out to be 4 pi del of r. So this term here inside that integral is this right-hand term here. So if I write that, I have that C over the volume. Del squared 1 over R, substitute in, that's 4 pi 
del of R, integrate over a volume, and that's got to equal minus the integral over that volume of del of R dV I'll fudge that minus sign a little bit and I'll get my constant is equal to 1 over 4 pi and I'll get my G will now equal of R will now equal e to the minus gamma R over 4 pi R. And the other way to think about that is um, there. The other way to think about that is, if I'm in a plane, and I ask how many degrees or how many radians are in a circle, then what I would do is I would take the circumference of that circle, two pi r, and I would divide through by the radius. So two pi r over r will give me the two pi of the angle of a circle, right? Now, if I want to know what the, if I want to know what, how many similar radians are in a sphere, then what I'll do is I'll take the surface area of the sphere, and what's that equal to? 4 pi r squared, and I'll divide by the r squared of the, of the, of the sphere, and so the relative, the relative steradians, that was not a stutter, that's a real word, radians go to steradians, and there are four pi steradians in a sphere. This delta function is spreading its strength, its unity strength, over all of that four pi steradians, into all of that four pi steradians, which is why you have that four pi sticking there. Okay, so that's where that there. That's where the four pi comes from, and that's that's where. If if, if you have a hemisphere that has two pi steradians, if you chop that in half, it has pi steradians. Okay, so steradians are that steradians is called a solid angle, right? For in a plane, you have an angle, and now you have you turn you rotate that around in three dimensions, you now have not just an angle, but a solid angle. And you measure solid angles in terms of steradians. And you find out exactly the area of the cap that fits on the little cone that you're radiating, and divide through by r squared, and that gives you the total amount of steradians. And if that cap is too, if getting the area of the cap is a little bit too hard, or if it's, too, if it's very narrow, then that cap may is usually approximated by just the face of that cone. But that's an approximation. So you'll get a slightly different steradian number. And, and this is a very useful unit of measure for antennas, right? Think, about, think back to your dish antenna. And if you run it the other way and you have a source, it propagates out to that dish and then the dish catches a certain cone which means a certain steradians, and then it delivers that energy back out into, the, into space. Okay. Or think about your flashlight with the, with, the, with the reflector. Light will emit from the light, from the light bulb. The reflector captures a certain amount of solid angle and refocuses it down. Okay. So for all antenna problems, this business of steradians is a useful is a useful measure and 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 if you've ever wondered where all those four, four pies come from, well, when you see a four pie, eh, and it's a volume problem, you, you have a chance that that's going to have a steradian in there. Okay. All right. Well, that's a pretty good place to stop for the night. 
we covered an awful lot of ground. So on Monday, I'll go back through some of that. But if you think about it, we are now almost ready. Well, we're about halfway through being able to derive what this guy is going to be. Okay? We've made progress and we've identified the G.